You look good. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, just a word of encouragement uh, or announcement, whatever you need. Um, I was praying about uh, which direction to go and uh, with our uh, sermon series and following Mother's Day. Uh, by the way, I think my wife did a fantastic job on Sunday morning. And so I got saved, uh, gave my heart to the Lord that afternoon, then, then backslid at a birthday party. So, but I'm doing good. Um, but where I just, I felt so strongly that we were to do a series on the Holy Spirit. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to do a series on the Holy Spirit culminating uh, on Pentecost Sunday. Go figure. And so, um, just in that sense, I don't have a specific title for it, but the, the, this week we're going to talk about living spirit-formed lives. And how God just led me back to Genesis, of course, one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, the earth was void or empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. He's the executive branch of the Trinity, if you will, uh, waiting to empower and activate the Word of God. And then God said, let there be light, and the Spirit of God, and it's where it says the Spirit of God was hovering, doesn't mean like a helicopter, just stationary it literally means brooding or or flying back and forth over the the face of the waters waiting it's this sense of just waiting for the word of the lord to be spoken so that he could bring it to pass and he does the same thing it's the same pattern in scripture at recreation when God creates new life in us, He does it through the same means. The Holy Spirit is obviously around us, but Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit in John 20. That was before the day of Pentecost, and then He told them to wait for the promise of the Father. And so the Holy Spirit was already at work in, him, in them, activating the Word of God, and then when he fell on the day of Pentecost, the, the thing that was so distinguished them from that point forward was life change and transformation. And we've turned the Holy Spirit into a doctrine instead of a person. And he's the third person of the Trinity. And he still wants to do the same work in our life and have the same effect. And so then we've, we've segregated the Holy Spirit into Pentecostal churches and non-Pentecostal churches or spirit-filled churches and other churches that claim to be spirit-filled. They just don't want anything to do with the Spirit. And, you know, I think it grieves the heart of God because his pattern wasn't to establish denominations where he'd be welcome and others where he'd be tolerated. It was to empower his church to go reach the world. And it's just, that's really strong on my heart that if we don't allow the Spirit of God to form our lives after the image of Christ, then the world around us will form our lives. Romans 12, 2 says from the Phillips translation, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And the pressures of life, the situations that we walk through, will will form us into somebody other than who God created us to be. Only the Spirit of God can form us into who God created us to be because only the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, knows what that is. And He activates the Word of God in us to be everything that God created us to be, every gift that God gave us before one of our days came to be. And so I'm so... Uh, concerned about Christians who who no longer live spirit formed lives and they're the frustration there's no distinction there's no real evidence of life change in so many of them the divorce rate in the church 
is about equal to the divorce rate in the world. Where's the distinction in that? It's because we don't allow the, to ourselves to live spirit-formed lives, so we don't bring that into spirit-formed homes and spirit-formed marriages and spirit-formed parents and, and relying on the spirit of God, the spirit of life operating in us. So rather than to preach the rest of that uh, message tonight, uh, I'll talk about praying with confidence, but um, I just I have a real sense of anticipation, had some, uh, just a couple of excellent conversations, even this afternoon uh, with some folks, and it was like, man, that's exactly what I need. That, that's exactly, and then they were talking about situations in their life or other people that they knew and, you know, the disappointments and struggles and that people are walking through who claim to know God and walk with them and, and all that, but we kind of just get away. And so we're going to talk about being spirit-formed, spirit-filled, and then we'll talk of the third part of that message about the Spirit's fire. And 1 Thessalonians 5 says very emphatically, do not put out the Spirit's fire. And don't treat prophecies with contempt. And so when we just kind of, there's two ways to put out a fire. You can either pour water on it uh, and just extinguish it, or you can just neglect it and it'll burn itself out. And I think Paul is referring to both of those things. Don't douse the Spirit's fire by treating prophecy with contempt. Um, but, but the other side is don't, don't put out the Spirit's fire by just neglecting it, just pushing the log off to the corner of the fireplace. And he's, it's no longer a comfort if the fire's not burning. Um, even in the Old Testament, God was a pillar of fire by night. Why is that? Because it lights up the darkness and uh, fire in the, in the desert would provide warmth, especially a, a fire that was in a, a pillar. It would have been a, a jet fire. And, and so that sense of even there, God marking our lives with his presence, but as well as his comfort, his protection, his provision through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you need to know more about the Holy Spirit or just uh, know someone who does, just needs to be encouraged, I want to encourage you to, to invite some folks and, and uh, let's, let's let the Spirit of God do what he said he would do, building the church and empowering us. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay, tonight let's uh, jump into this. Uh, we're going to talk about praying with confidence praying with confidence and uh, I was just thinking about so many times uh, in, in regard here, here's my day uh, I'm not a great multitasker uh, and, and so sometimes I get this creative flow going and so I'm, I'm working on a, the next series uh, after the Holy Spirit um, and I think we're going to go through Deuteronomy and so I've got some ideas about Deuteronomy and some creative stuff. And so I'm finding information. So I'm jumping over there, working ahead. Can you believe that? And, and then this series on the Holy Spirit's really on my heart. And then I was preparing for tonight, this message. And so it was like a semi-schizophrenic day that I was, I got three notepads and two pens and four Bibles open in my computer. And I was going around. So I'll try to I'll try to bring it all together but the real essence of that is that God wants us to live lives of confidence confidence in prayer that that prayer for us entering the presence of God is never meant to be a gamble maybe I get it maybe I don't but you know I'm gonna give it a shot and see if the big guy's listening and and all of that it's meant to be this place not only of conversation where we share our hearts with God and let him minister to us in that place of prayer but as well this place of confidence to even enter his presence and so many times we struggle with that because we know ourselves and our lives and our issues and so it's this whole deal of are we going to hide those from the Lord or are we going to let that be the invitation to come before him just as we are and the, the prayer of confidence is not based on us being so eloquent in prayer. It, it's just having hearts 
that are confident in his presence to come before him. What we sang about tonight, that, Lord, you're the one that revives me. And, and then I thought the awesome part is that it's not just this God of revival. It's a good, good father who revives us. He doesn't want his children being weary. He wants to encourage us. He wants to pick us up. And, and he went through everything for us to set an example so that we can live in confidence before him. So several passages of scripture, and then I'll just comment on these, but I, I really felt like the Lord just wanted to impart this to us. If we'll open our hearts and receive tonight, that a real spirit of revival as well as just ramping up our confidence in prayer and, and coming before him. So the first one is Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 23. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, since we have confidence, not that we gain confidence, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Obviously, this is a, a passage that, that compares the priesthood of the Lord to the Old Testament priesthood and one of the key uh, aspects of the priesthood in the Old Testament was to to come into the tabernacle into the Holy of Holies and on the uh, holy day holiest day of the year the pr the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies come before the presence of the holiness of God the Ark of the Covenant that was uh, between the wings of the cherubim uh, as a represented as a flame that was there and he was to take blood and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat uh, that was represented there by the Ark of the Covenant. And he was to intercede for the people and that he could only come once a year on behalf of the people and only with blood. And if there were issues in his life or sin in his life or the blood hadn't been applied to his life, then he wouldn't make it out alive. So, so it's a serious deal and they wasn't necessarily coming with confidence they were coming because of a commandment and, and it was literally the fear of the Lord. And so here it's talking about the Lord Jesus and his ministry there and says now we don't have fear in entering the, the most holy place. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. It's not the blood of bulls and goats that, that was a covering for sin. It's the blood of Jesus Christ which is now cleansing for all sin can you say amen and so then he says not only by the blood of Jesus but by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body and since we have a great high priest over the house of God let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith that that having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Notice that he doesn't say let us hold unswervingly to the faith we profess and let's try our best to be faithful. It's not about our faithfulness, it's about his faithfulness and so it's all the more confidence that we have that it's not something we've earned, it's something we've been invited into because of what Jesus has given us. And then verse 24 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. One of the things that is more lacking in our society and becomes more so all the time it is a spirit of encouragement. And it's being swallowed up by a spirit of criticism and a spirit of envy and the, the, the things of the enemy. And God says we need to be encouragers and all the more as we see the day approaching, the day of the Lord. And so we don't let... Uh, fear of those things or whatever causes us to shrink back but it, it needs to be that, that we continue to minister in that level of confidence and all the more so we need to be increasing in that so, so here I read that because this is such a great passage to read 
when it seems difficult to enter the presence of the Lord. And here's why. It says that we have confidence. Then later it says we have full assurance that, that we can come because of these things. So here's what I want to see real quick. We have a privilege of entering. It says, let us enter the presence of the Lord. Let us draw near. We have a privilege of entry and that's confidence. Number two, we have power to enter and that's by the blood of Jesus. Number three, we have a point of entry. That's by a new and living way. And then we have a person safeguarding that entrance, a great high priest over the house of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us draw near to God with full assurance and total confidence because he is faithful. Can you say amen? So the invitation here is not just to pray, but to pray with confidence. And that our confidence being based on the finished work of the cross and the ministry of the Lord to us through all that he has done. So, so there's three words tonight that I want to build this around. And the first is found there in that passage, full assurance, the word assurance, that we have an assurance that uh, we can come before the presence of the Lord. But not only an assurance, we have a reassurance that, that the word backs it up, not in just one place, but in many, and we'll look at a couple of those, but not only do, do we have an assurance, an affirmation from the Lord, and a reassurance, an encouragement in other places, but we have an insurance. We, we have an insurance policy that is signed in blood by the Lord Jesus Christ. It full effect, guaranteed, all right? So we'll, we'll look at that. Here's the Bill Wooler scripture. Uh, if you've been around Bill for very long, you've heard this scripture. I should let him quote it. He'll probably quote it along with me. He always does. And this is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to, in a, uh, according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have... And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, according to his will, we know that we have what we ask of him. Now, some people quote that, but then they try to explain it. And the explanation is, John meant exactly what he said in that passage of scripture, because it wasn't John's affirmation. It was the Holy Spirit moving John to write it. I might remind you that John is the same John that, that saw worship in heaven, saw the Lord Jesus and didn't even have words to describe it, that it was so overwhelming he fell down on his face like a dead man, fainted, and then God picked him up and said, stand on your feet and write down what you're about to see. That's the entire book of Revelation, that, that John got to see a prayer meeting in heaven. John got to see the angels of God worshiping the lamb around the throne. And John writes with this sense and says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. The writer of Hebrews says, let us, let us draw near with confidence and, and full assurance. John takes it a step farther and said, here's the confidence we have in approaching God. You struggling with your prayer? All you got to understand is if you pray, he hears you. And if he hears you, he responds. End of story. Now let me read it again. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, key phrase, but God's word is God's will. So we never have to ask like it's a question. Like, Lord, if it's your will, we can pray if it's your will, but we pray that with confidence. That, that in situations where his word hasn't emphatically said, this is my will, and we're praying, we don't have to pray whether or not God can heal or whether God will heal. We know that it's God's will to heal. 
So that's what we pray. In confidence approaching God. Well, what about the times it didn't work? Well, well, what about the times it did? And, and what about the times it didn't work where God was just waiting for somebody to approach him with confidence? Not only the confidence of the quality of your prayer, but much more on the confidence of the quality of his hearing. That if we ask anything according to his will, it activates God's response in heaven. That if we pray, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask according to his will, that he responds to that. We have what we ask of him. Can you say amen? We pray, he hears. He hears, he responds. That gives me great confidence. There's not one aspect of that scripture that depends on us, except in approaching and in asking. Amen? Iffy amen or confident amen? That sounds a lot better right there. Hebrews chapter 4. Here's another one. Verses 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, which is a summation of the things that were written just immediately before that. We won't go through it. Therefore, since... We have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, which means that he also descended to the earth and lived for 33 years. That same high priest ascended and is now on his rightful throne in heaven, but he's carrying on here, it's defining his priestly ministry. We have a great high priest ascended into heaven Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize, some translations say sympathize, with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace, how? With confidence or boldly. Boldness is simply acting on the confidence that we have in God with the humility that comes from knowing he is who he said he was and we know his presence. So it's not arrogance, it's not haughtiness, it's not being cocky in the presence of God. It's this boldness that comes from asking God anything and know that he will do it because our hearts have been so convicted by the presence of the Lord. So that if we approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and we may find grace to help us in our time of need not after our time of need which produces guilt which said I should have prayed about that before which oh by the way and I'm sorry Lord and which under erodes our confidence in prayer rather than amplifies it so he says here it's interesting to me that we receive mercy and we find grace because as we approach God's throne of grace with confidence uh, that we receive mercy that's poured out upon us but then as we're there in his presence we find the grace to help us in our time of need that that the Lord's already aware of the situation that he's already uh, empathizing or sympathizing with our weaknesses he empathizes with our struggles and our temptation, gone through them, yet without sin. So we come not to a throne of judgment, not to a throne of justice, to a throne of grace to help us in our time of need. Anybody grateful for that? So the last thing we'll, we'll touch on here for a second is our insurance in prayer. Uh, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we referenced that earlier. So in addition to that, Here's Matthew chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. 
the Lord's teaching them this model for prayer. And so he says, do not be like them, those who pray to be seen of men and who repeat these prayers uh, piously on a street corner. And he said, for they have their reward. And so he's making a comparison. He said, don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now here's the deal. I've had people tell me, well, if God already knew what I needed, why didn't he help me? Because he wants you to ask. Can I just tell you a secret to a, to a true father's heart? It's not selfishness. It's the fact that, that we, we want to give it to you, whatever it is, birthday present or whatever. We had a birthday for our party for our granddaughter, Morgan or Bergen, whichever she's known by at the time. She calls herself Bergen, but her name's Morgan. And then at other times we call her other stuff because she's a rascal. But, but God's got a unique plan for her life and the enemy better watch out. So, so uh, Kim assigned me the duty on Saturday of going uh, shopping to pick out uh, a birthday present for her. And then Sunday afternoon, Mother's Day afternoon was her party. So, so there's two things I absolutely hate is toys are us, which is like demons be us. And, and so she said, I think probably what, what we want to get is this little art pack thing. And I think it, it's either going to be at Hobby Lobby. Ah, toys R Us. Satan. Or Walmart. That's right. Give me a dull fork and stick me in the eye. On a Saturday afternoon before Mother's Day. But I was bold, and it was really in my heart not so much to do it for Kim, but because I really wanted to do it for Morgan. But it wasn't just the fact that I wanted to give her some little whatever because we felt obligated to take a birthday present to give it to her in a bag. I wanted to buy out the store. I wanted to buy out the, but I, I, I hate giving gifts that are just obligatory gifts. Here's a little something we got for you. No, we didn't. We felt obligated, and so we threw this together. And so, so we're talking, you know, what do you think? And, you know, you're looking at stuff's overwhelming. We got 4,000 dolls and whatever, whatever. And so I was really getting frustrated. But my heart was, I wanted to find just the right thing. And, and see, the, the, the thing is, she's four. And she hadn't had a nap and she was clueless she didn't care if she got any gifts the, the day before Liz went to a big uh, what are they, dragon boat races they have this big uh, business thing in, in Jackson and it was a for a community bank where she works and so there were thousands of people there and so she got to take Morgan to this big event at the lake and so they had jumpy castles and hundreds of people there and food and these boat races and so they got there and Morgan the day before her birthday says mama you surprised me this is the best birthday party ever she thought the city of Jackson put on the business expo for her birthday and I'm thinking a wise mother would have said, happy birthday, sweetheart. We put it all together just for you and then canceled the rest of the stuff. But no, we had to walk through it. So, so, so my point was that, that my heart was all ready to give it. We already had the, the present and we could have got some little whatever, but here's a box of crayons, you know, God bless you and enjoy it. But, but the deal was, not only did we want to give it, we wanted it to be something that she would love and treasure, not just because it was from us, but because we knew what was in her heart. And see, the father 
has a heart like that for all of his kids that he already knows what we need before we ask not only that he knows what we want he gives us the desires of our heart not because we're selfish and whining because God can turn your water into wine but he can't turn your whining into anything so stop it and so his heart is to give us these things but he loves it when we ask because it connects our heart back to his that he's placed in that sense of being the source not the one in control and it's never out of manipulation if it was then Jesus God would have held Jesus on the cross and said if you don't live right he ain't dying he's just gonna suffer and it's gonna be your fault and that's what religion puts on us the guilt and condemnation of what we did to Jesus rather than the heart of the Father in sending him for us to do something we could never do and that's where the Spirit of God comes and connects us back to the heart of the Father who knows what we need before we ask but he loves it when we ask because he's already provided and then he releases it to us that was a really good part right there wasn't even in my notes John 16 this is in my notes verses 23 and 24 excuse me I didn't finish the first one Matthew 6 8 through 10 Jesus said don't be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask then in verse 9 he says this then is how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and he goes through and finishes the prayer model here's the basis for it John 16 verses 23 and 24 Jesus is talking to his disciples and and he's uh, this is the culmination right before uh, John 17 his high priestly prayer for us but he's imparting to them these essential truths and he said in that day you will no longer ask me anything very truly I tell you my father will give you whatever you ask in my name until now you've not asked for anything in my name because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus he hadn't come but now not only has he come but he's telling them preparing them for his departure and his death but the expectation of his resurrection so that he can pour out the power of the spirit so that he can ascend back to the throne in heaven where he's standing and praying for us how awesome is that talk about confidence so he says to them uh, uh, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name until now you've not asked for anything in my name ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete there's a joy that comes with anticipation of good things there's also a joy that comes just in, in approaching God and recognizing that wait a minute I'm accessing all the resources of heaven but there's a greater joy that comes when God meets us at that place and answers the prayer and so it completes the joy of anticipation can you say amen so Jesus made a covenant his covenant is an insurance policy he signed that covenant in his blood and said that we can all participate in it and so it's the insurance of all that we need the confidence so here's here's what we got I want you to picture this in, in your mind tonight as we pray Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them why should we have such confidence in prayer I'll tell you three powerful things number one God's praying for you Jesus Christ is praying for you but he's doing it so that we can pray to him and and, and he can tell the father now we're praying in agreement do, do you hear them father do you hear me and we're we're releasing your will as we connect here in agreement Jesus is praying for you 
Number two, the Holy Spirit wants to pray through you even when you don't know what to pray. So that you don't have to pray this gamble, this roll of the dice, this maybe, maybe not, if, may, if not, that you can pray with confidence even when you don't know how to pray, Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us even through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Go figure. Because he is God. So he knows the will of God and he enforces the will of God. And here's the last one, which is powerful. Not only is Jesus praying for us, not only does the Holy Spirit pray through us, even when we don't know what to pray, but we're to pray for one another. Sometimes you don't have the strength to pray. Sometimes grief overwhelms you, or Kim was talking about uh, on Sunday, the, just speaking the confession, God's word over her life, and the, the battle that that was, that the enemy came in, and she couldn't even remember what she wrote. And, and so literally, she's got, I don't know, 10 or 12 pages in that notebook where she copied the same thing over and over and over again and then would read it. Well, all she needed to do was write it once and then reread it. But the powerful thing was, as she wrote it out and wrote it out and wrote it out, now it's getting in her. It's not just memorization. It's the impartation of the Spirit of God and then the encouragement of one another being in that place of agreement. James 5, 16, and then we'll pray together. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a great high priest is powerful and effective. The prayer of a Holy Spirit is powerful and effective. And the prayer of a person standing in the righteousness of God is powerful and effective as well. Amen? So that we can always, always, always pray with confidence. Lift your hands with me, would you? Right there where you sit. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you that you modeled prayer so well for us. Father, uh, you, you modeled it in the sense, uh, Lord Jesus, that you would often withdraw to places all by yourself just to pray. But other times you would lead the disciples and you would lead groups. You would demonstrate the power of that prayer in healing and deliverance. You'd lift your voice beside a grave and call Lazarus forth from a tomb, simply bowing your head and saying, Father, I thank you that you hear me and that you always hear me. And then release the power of God. Lord, that you didn't do anything without prayer, without thanksgiving, without gratitude, without lifting your heart to the Father. And I pray that our hearts would be just as confident in a place just as strong in relationship with you. That you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation among ourselves so that we can know you better. Let that same spirit work in us, Lord God, when we can't find the words, we don't know what to say, we don't know how to express it. But Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would teach us scripture, would, would quicken our hearts, would move within us with compassion and mercy like he did through Jesus. Father, like he's promised to do through all of us. And I pray that we would be faithful, Lord, not just to uh, let somebody know we will be praying, but that we would actually engage in that. The prayer for one another, standing in the place of righteousness in God is powerful and effective. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the confidence that's ours in Christ Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Does anybody need uh, prayer tonight specifically just before we go? I want us to agree together with you. I want to give a praise report. Uh, talked to Rob uh, Cummins this week. He's doing great. Uh, recouping. They were having still just a little bit of problems with the uh, incisions where they took the veins, but that's going well. And he's up and walking and going. 
and can't wait to be back with us uh, and be praying for Leona. Uh, she went in with an emergency appendectomy, they thought, and then she's, they're going to keep try to keep her on medication for a few weeks. So uh, she's still in some discomfort, so we need to be praying about that. And uh, something else, but I forgot. Amen. Let's stand. If there's somebody around you that needs prayer, pray for one another. Not bless one another in the name of the Lord. And be praying for me and us on Sunday morning as we start our Holy Spirit series. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you, everybody. Have a great week in the Lord.